Uh, my name is Cesar, and yes, you're looking at this picture, you're wondering, am I in the right talk? And yes, you are. We're here to talk about functional programming, and in particular about uh, Monad and Functor. Uh, and hopefully you will understand why this picture makes sense at the end. So, um, before I want to, so this talk is a bit of a journey. It's a bit of a cliche thing to say, but I promise it is. Uh, I'm gonna talk about a lot of different things, and at the end it all comes together, and it makes sense, hopefully. So first, before uh, I give you the talk, I want to tell you why I'm giving this talk. So, uh, I'm a Java developer, and I've been using Java for, uh, since basically my first job, and when Java 8 came up, um, I was very interested in things like lambdas, and, and I started reading articles, and I kept coming upon this uh, term called monad, and this is kind of how I was feeling at the time. I was like, what is this monad? And either people would just mention it as if it's something that we should all know about, or you would find really big and lengthy article of what modern is, and you would see Haskell code, and I was like, I have, I have no idea what this is, and this is kind of how I was feeling. And you know, because I kind of liked that sort of things, I started uh, getting uh, to studying a bit more functional programming, and especially I started looking into the math behind functional programming, which is called category theory, and after kind of you know, reading the formal definition of a monad, I became like this. Okay, so now I know what a monad is, you know, I mean, I know the mathematical definition. I still don't really don't get it. And then, you know, one day, that happened. Okay, boom. I had this epiphany, and I was like, oh my god. Mona is actually so simple. And then I went to this. Like, why isn't everyone, you know, this is obvious. Mona is so simple. Um, so, so that's the reason I'm doing this talk. I would like to uh, explain to everyone I mean, I would like everyone to have the same epiphany about Monad and realize that it's really not complex and uh, it's something that is, that is worth an understanding about. So, just one disclaimer. I don't know if you know this uh, ancient mathematician. And he kind of says that you cannot talk about Monad without being very rigorous mathematically. And I think that's a big problem and I totally disagree with it. And that's the reason a lot of people, especially in the Java community, they don't, oh no, I don't know what Monad is, I don't know what Functor, it's too complex. And I think that's because when people understand Monad, they want to write a blog post about it, and they will talk about all of this category theory, and I think it really uh, puts people off, and, and I don't think that's a very inclusive thing to do. So this is kind of, I would, what, today I'm going to explain what Monad is, and I'm going to say things that are not 100% true, and I will, I will uh, basically not talk about certain things, but the point is I want you to remember about what Monad is, and if you really want to get into the nitty gritty, you can do that in your own time. So, but then the question is, okay, why should you care about it? Well, uh, it seems that nowadays functional programming is everywhere, and I think it's been like that for a while. Uh, a language called Lisp uh, was invented in, uh, released in 1958, uh, you know, so it's always been there, but it seems like nowadays it's even more, uh, even more popular. Uh, languages like Haskell, Scala, Kotlin, C Sharp, uh, Ruby, Java 8, and all of the reactive frameworks, they all borrow principles, uh, and they all use different elements of functional programming. Uh, in my opinion, uh, sorry, in my uh, observation is that the knowledge about functional programming is not well um, spread between communities. So for instance, in the Java community, very few people know Monad and Functor. But if you go to a Scala meetup, people talk about that as if it's just, you know, classes and, and variables. It's very interesting to see the difference. So when I noticed this difference, I kind of started on a journey of, okay, I want the people that work with Java to kind of understand that because there is no reason, you know, uh, for them not to know. Uh, I think functional uh, code, uh, functional programming allows us to write better code. So what is a better code? I put in, in, uh, in quote. Well, I think uh, strong typing means we can write a robust and expressive code. Expressive is, I think, if you have a, a, a well-typed function, it's almost self-documented. It tells you a lot of things that you need to know about the, about the function. Um, again, following that, we have more readability, so you kind of encourage to write smaller functions that do less. Um, I mean, within functional programming, and I will talk about this later, there is this, you know, we like to make things immutable, and that makes the code much easier to, to, to think about. There is no global state, global variable that you need to think, oh, what's the value in that? It's everything is a function, takes an argument, returns another one. Uh, we can reuse functions, so uh, it means that, I think in theory, we, we in, we, 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 we're going to be writing less code, sorry. And so this is something very interesting uh, that I came across a few years ago, is that functional programming is simple when you're familiar with it. And this is the principle that uh, Venkat, uh, who's doing a talk actually soon, um, he was giving a talk on a virtual jug and he was a, doing a talk on the art of simplicity. And at some point he put a slide on and there was a, a Chinese character and he asked the audience, uh, do you think this is simple or complex? And 
most of, I mean, you know, the people that are like me, European, though I don't read Chinese, so I think, okay, it's complex. And actually then, the, what the sign meant, it meant simple. And here the, solu the lesson was that familiarity and complexity are orthogonal principles. You know, um, the complexity is inherent to the problem that you're trying to solve. Uh, I mean, sometimes you can simplify a problem, but you know, at, at, at the end of the day, sometimes you know, there's so much you can do. However, familiarity is something that you really have control over because you can learn. And I think if you look at functional programming, you look, oh, it's complex. Actually, I think it's objectively simpler because there is less thing going on, there's less to worry about. But there is this initial maybe barrier of entry that you have to become familiar with it. And I think it's, it's worth it. So. So now we have some context of why I'm doing this talk, why you should care about the talk. And so before we start this journey, we need to have a, a common language. So this is what I'm going to do now. I'm good, I will introduce some notations and some principles so that we can communicate. So the first one that I want to talk about is function type. So throughout this talk, I reuse some uh, syntax from Haskell. You don't, don't worry about it. I, I use it because I think it's simple. Um, but you don't, you don't need to know Haskell. So the first one. Um, it's called the function type. So if you have a, a, a real functional uh, language, functions are first class citizen, which means that they can have a type. So here, uh, when we say f column column a or b, it means we have a variable f, and the type of this variable is a function from a to b. And a and b are types. And what's a type? A type is a set of values. So here, for instance, we have uh, a first type, which is A, which is the set of circles. And then we have the second type, B, which is the set of square. And my function F must map every element of A into an element of B. And so, you know, for instance, I could write a pass int function that goes from string to int. Or in Java, we would write it the other way around. We would say that it's a pass int, it returns an int, and it takes a string. But at the end of the day, it goes from string to int. Um, if we need to represent multiple variables, we can do it like that. So here we have a function add, and we'd say that add, uh, it takes an int, a first int, a second int, and then it returns a third int. Uh, in Java, we would write it uh, with uh, two ints. And this is something called currying. Uh, you can think of it as a function of two variables, or you can also think of it as one function that returns a second function. It's, it's the, the two are exactly equivalent. But I, I don't really want to go too much into that, but this is just how you would write multiple a function of multiple arguments. Now, a very important principle is called function composition. And I think it's quite intuitive, is that here we have two functions, function f from a to b, and function g from b to c. And actually what we can do is that the output of f is the input of g. So we can give the output of f to g. This is called composing this function. It means that we can have a function that goes from a to c directly. And this is pronounced G after F. The little round operator is pronounced after. So first you apply F, and then you apply G. So if we have a function F from A to B, a function G from B to C, the function G after F goes from A to C. We bypass the middle person. And interestingly, I, I couldn't really resist not mentioning that, this after operator is itself a function in Haskell. And this is something called a higher order function. And I'll explain what that means later. But it's a function that takes two arguments. First, it takes the function from A to B. Then it takes the function from B to C, and it returns a new function from A to C. So this is kind of interesting that this, this is itself a function in Haskell. So what's a higher order function? Well, a higher order function is the function that either receives a function as an argument and or returns a function uh, as a result. So here, the first function is a boring function. It just, you know, it's a first order function. You give it a number, it multiplies by two. OK, boring. The second one is called multiply by. So you give it a number n, and it returns you a function that multiplies by that number. So this is a high order function. And the last one is a high order function for two reasons, because it takes a function f as an argument, it basically applies it twice, and it returns a new function of the same type. So again, this is an, so these are examples of higher order function, and we will um, come that across later in the talk. So now I want to talk about some, something called pure functional programming, and you might have heard that term before. This is not linked to any language. It's more of a philosophy or of way of writing uh, code. So it's based on a set of principles. That programs are composed of pure functions. So what's a pure function? It's a function that has no side effect. I will explain what that means. But basically, it means that your function can be memoized. Uh, it always returns the same output for a given input. So if you had a function from integers to integer, you could run your function for every possible integer. You could store the result into a file. 
And then instead of calling a function, you would just read that file, like a cache. And it should do exactly the same thing. So the things that a pure function cannot do are the side effect, and here is a list. So you cannot modify a variable, you cannot modify a data structure. So you cannot modify a variable outside of your function. You're allowed to have uh, variables within your function, that's okay. Uh, you cannot set a field on an object, you cannot throw exception, you cannot read or write to the cancel, you cannot write a file, you cannot, basically you cannot do anything useful. So of course there are a way around that, otherwise it would, it would be a very abstract thing. And in functional prog uh, programming, we much prefer the declarative style over the imperative style. And in the imperative style, you are telling the computer what to do. So for instance, if you want to iterate to an array, you say a four, you have to give a variable i, you have to say when it starts, when it stops. In a um, declarative style, you just say for each. You know, I, I, I don't want to tell the computer how to iterate an array. This is some basic stuff, and this is really the big difference. And, this, and it's, it's, I think, why a functional programming is simpler, because there is less going on, in my opinion. And this is uh, where the uh, Scala Red Book, where I got the, the side effect definition. So this is talking about exceptions. So this, you know, back in the days when I was still commuting to the office, so this is a picture I took in Cannon Street in London. Um, and this is pretty embarrassing. Uh, of course, I don't know if you can read, but this is .NET, so this would never happen in Java, but still, you know, we need to be um, careful. So an interesting thing about exception is that exceptions are partial functions. So what, what do I mean by that? Well, I say that a function is a mapping from two sets. So it means that a function from A to B, if you give me an A, I will give you a B for every possible A. But actually, if you have exception, it means that, oh, there are some input that do not give you an output. And this is really, uh, it's a lie. Because if you look at a function signature as a contract, well, you're breaking the contract. And for instance, if you have a function that takes an int and returns an int, no, actually, uh, there are certain ints that are not val val um, valid. Please open the documentation. And you know, so this is, it's, um, it's, um, it's not good. Because basically, when I, when I look at the function signature, I want this to be my contract. OK, so there's something to keep in mind. So, if you can't do all of that useful stuff, how do you make functional programming that are useful? Well, the idea is that you want to minimize the side effect. So here, uh, I went to the cloud and I took a picture of your code from the, from the sky, and this is how it should look. Uh, the, the green bit in the middle is the code that is only written using pure functions, and then you might have one file or just be on the out outside of your program when you do all of the nasty things, like connecting to the input, the output, the log, the database. It's a bit like unit testing. You know, you're kind of pushing all of the, the problems at the end, and then at the end you have to kind of connect the dots. Okay, so now we have some context, um, and really the, the, the end of this, the goal of this talk is for you to understand functor, uh, sorry, monad, but before we do this, we need to have a stop at, the, at functor. So we'll go through functor, then we'll put it on the side, and we'll see that at the end it kind of makes sense. So what's a functor? Um, so from now on, I will start using these very abstract colors and shape to represent types, and that's on purpose. So here we have a blue, uh, which is a type. It could be string, it could be int. If you're using a, a language with classes, it could be your own class. It's anything that you want, it's a type. And to this type, we can apply a functor to it to create another type. So if you want a concrete example, think of generics in Java. If you have list, list is a functor, because if you take list, you apply list to the type integer, and now you have list of integer. So you, cr you were able to create a new type. And here we say that we put the type inside the functor. So the functor is a bit like a container for types. So, I, so that is the first contract of a functor. Now the second thing it needs to do is, well, what if we have another type, yellow? Well, we can also then apply the functor to yellow. So now we have four types. We have blue, blue in a box, yellow, yellow in a box. But if we have a function g from blue to yellow, then the functor must also be able to produce a function called map g that goes from blue in a box to yellow in a box. Okay, so this is called lifting that function. So map is a function that creates another function. Um, and in terms of uh, signature, so we can say that, okay, we have the first, we have functor which takes a type a and creates a new type f of a. And if we have a function from a to b, map, it takes a function from a to b, so that would be g in this case, and then it, ret it, then it takes, it returns basically a new function, or you could say it, it takes an f of a, which is this one, and returns an f of b. And then if I apply map to g, I just get a function from f a to f b. Now, if you know Java, and you, you might have seen this function map, you've seen it on stream or optional, 
you realize that it, it doesn't look exactly like that. And the reason for that is because Java is an object-oriented language. So it has the concept of classes. So it means that if you have an optional class, you can write map inside that class. It means that you can write map inside this object here. But in traditional um, functional programming languages like Haskell's, there was no classes. So it's written as a static method instead. So instead of um, uh, being inside the, the, the functor, it's on the outside. So this is why we have this extra argument here. And in Java, this would be just this, if you're in the context of the object. OK. So let's look at some examples of functors. And I actually already mentioned them. Um, so here, let's say we have a function from blue to yellow. Uh, let's look at optional. So optional is a, is a very useful uh, functor. And conceptually, you could uh, imagine that functor is implemented, sorry, that optional is implemented as an abstract or an interface. And then it has two possible implementations. It has one called sum in the case when we have actually a blue, or it could be called empty. So in the Java uh, uh, JDK, if you look inside the code, it's not done like that. But normally, that's how it should have been done. And so to be able to implement a map, we need to basically implement map for this, this, these two cases. So what should be uh, map G when uh, on the case of sum? And this is a very interesting thing that I love in functional programming is that in this case, there's only one possible implementation that makes sense. Because think of it. So we know we have a blue. And we have a function from blue to yellow. The only thing we can do is that we can call that function. We, now we have a yellow. But we know that functor must still return an optional. So I need to put my yellow in something. Well, it has to be a, a sum. Here, the only thing that makes sense is, is sum of yellow. And, and the same in the other case. In the case of empty, you have nothing. What can you do with nothing? Nothing. And what's interesting here is that the, the reason we, there's only one implementation possible is because I call these shapes blue and yellow. If I said, OK, now let's write a map for optional of string, now suddenly there are a million possible. Because for instance, you know, uh, mapping an empty, I could return sum with string hello. That would compile, because I know that, because I can conjure up string. But here, what's blue? I don't know what's blue. So I don't know how to create a blue. And so because we know less about the type, it means that we actually it help us write code. It's a bit strange principle. But sometimes making less assumption means we can write better code. Let's look at another functor, list. So here it's a linked list. We have two elements. And we need to apply map G to, to this. Well, again, what else can we do? The only thing we can do is apply G to every single element, and we get a list of yellows. And here, the very important observation is that functor, it changes the content of the box, but it never changes the structure of the box. In the case of optional, when we had a sum, we, we uh, stay with the sum. When we had an empty, we stay with empty. With the list, we had two elements. We apply map, we still have two elements. So we change the content, but not the structure. So to summarize, functor, it's a container for types. The, the map can lift function from the raw type to the lifted types. The lifted function changed the content of the box, but not the box itself. The structure is unchanged. And this is the first definition that you need to remember. A functor is something that has map. Now, at this point, Boromir, if you remember this ancient manipulation, is getting a bit annoyed because this is not a valid or rigorous definition of functor. But that's the one that I want you to remember. Because then if you're interested, you can look into the little details that I kind of put under the carpet. But for otherwise, if you see a class, it has map, it's a functor. So now we can finally get into Monad. So Monad. Uh, I didn't mention yet, but there is this very interesting person called Bartosz Milewski. He's a physicist and also a programmer. And he writes a lot of uh, blog posts and books about the foundation, the mathematical foundations of, uh, of programming. And he has an article on Monad, like many people. And I think he makes a very interesting point about why so many people are baffled about Monad. And what he does, he has a little game. And the game is, OK, can you guess uh, what the mystery object is? And what he does is that he will, he will give a series of examples on how to use the object and see if someone can guess it. So what are the, the, the examples? Well, this mystery object, it can be used to fix the CO2 scrubbers on board of Apollo 13. OK, so it must be something to do in space. It can treat wart. OK, so it's becoming a bit weird. It can fix the Apple iPhone 4 dropped call issue, for those uh, old enough to remember that. Um, it can make a prom dress. And it can build a suspension bridge now. Can anyone guess what the mystery object is? Sorry? Human. Human. No, it's a duct tape. All right, so you know, 
this is, this is valid, but would you say that if you were to explain to a, a, you know, a child what duct tape is, would you go about this? No, you would say duct tape, it sticks things. And this is exactly the problem with Monad. You go online, you say what Monad is. Oh, Monad, IO Monad, List Monad, Option. You can wait a second. What's the, what's the common thing between these things? I don't understand. There is no uh, common thread. And this is what I'm, I'm going to try to do. So the lesson here is to understand Monad, don't use examples. And because we're much smarter here, we're going to use a use case, which is completely different. So what's the use case? The use case is we have, uh, we're given a string that contains two numbers separated by a comma. And what we want our program to do is to output the division of the two. OK, so we've, done, we've just heard about all this pure functional programming and, you know, OK, how to divide your problem into multiple functions. OK, let's try that. Well, here I need to do three things. The first thing is I need to split my string. So then I have two strings. Then I need to convert those strings into numbers. And finally, I can divide. OK, let's write three functions. So this is pseudo uh, Java code. I pretend that in Java we have uh, pairs. The reason for that is because otherwise it wouldn't fit into a screen, although I, I should have done that slide in Kotlin. That would have been a, a better choice. But anyway, it doesn't matter. This is just uh, kind of pseudo code. So here, first function split. Well, we just call us a string. We uh, split it by a comma and we return a pair of string. Then uh, pass, we take a pair of string and we convert this to a pair of doubles. And then divide, we take a pair of doubles and we finally return the number. Great. Fantastic. Now, interestingly, and actually by design, if we look at the type, we see that the output of split is the same as the input of pass, and that the output of pass is the same as the input of divide. And here, oh great, we can use this function composition. We can say that our final program is divide after pass after split. First I split, then I pass, then I divide. This is great, like one-liners are really the best. Um, so job done, right? Well, not really. I mean, actually, every single function that I wrote can go wrong. The first function, what happens if there is no comma in the string? What happens if there are multiple commas? The second one, what happens if I don't have numbers? And finally, what happens if I divide by zero? And so here, we write a program from string to double, but it's a partial function because not all possible string will result into a result. Actually, quite a lot of string would just make the program explode. So we need to do something about that. So what we can do is we can modify the, the signature of each function um, to return an embellished type. So take this with a pinch of salt for now, and we'll dig into that. So what do we mean by this? Is that if we had a function from blue to yellow, we do a refactoring in our uh, favorite uh, IDE, and we change that to something of yellow. And this, at the moment, I make zero assumption to this something of yellow. It's just something else. And actually, without really knowing, you're familiar with this technique. And this is, we can call that the wrapper type. So why are you familiar with it? Well, we, you already know optional. That sometimes if you write a piece of code that can fail, instead of just returning t, you, you will return option of t. And then you can decide if you want to return an uh, of or an empty. And in other languages, uh, like Scala, or if you want to use a Kotlin with Arrow, you can use the, the either type. And this is because with optional, you don't know what went wrong. So here, you have two types, left and right. In the left type, you put the error that, that happened, and on the right you put the result. So if everything, if, I mean, if there was a problem, you can return a left with an exception, which is very different than throwing, because you're returning as part of the result type, or you can return a right with the right result. You can actually do that as well for asynchronous processing. We have a, a method here, say hello, that returns string. If I change that string to a future of string, now suddenly I have something, I have changed behavior. I have a function that gives me a handle to something that will resolve to a future eventually. We could do this as well uh, to build a URL. Instead of having a function that returns a string, we can return a function from properties to string, and then we can use a lambda. And with this lambda, we can build the string that we want. So here, the message is, by changing the result type, uh, the return type, we can, we can add behavior to our code. OK. So um, let's, why not try to fix the problem that, we, that we've just had by using optional. So we change the, the method split to return optional of pair. We change the, the pass method to return optional of double. And return the divide to return optional of double. And then that's what we've got. And I think it's amazing. It's beautiful, this code. I really love it. I mean, how does it work? Um, you know, first you call split. You check if it's present. Then you get an optional. Because it's present, you can call get. Then you get another optional. You check if it's present. 
and so on and so on. And at the end, you finally get. And if any of those if fail, you return an optional empty. And the beauty of this, of this pattern is that if you have, let's say, 50 methods, you can uh, nest 50 ifs, and it just works. And I think, you know, for me, I just want to walk out of the door here. It's like a job done. Uh, you know, we have a code that is 100% perfect. It, 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 I mean, of course, we will have to write unit tests, but this code cannot fail. It's a beautiful, in terms of functional, it's beautiful. Now, I don't know if you know many uh, functional programmers. Uh, you know, sometimes it's often like, I mean, there's often one in each family. It's a bit like the weird uncle or the weird aunt. And if you don't know much something about them, one thing you need to know is that they are greedy. And here, they're not happy. They're complaining. OK, so maybe let's try to, before judging them, let's try to understand why they are not happy. The reason we're not happy is that we kind of messed up the type alignment. Now the types don't align, which means that, ah, where is the beautiful one-liner? We kind of lost that. And again, we don't need this, but maybe let's see how we could get to this one-liner if we wanted to. So the problem is that if we had a function um, from blue to this something of yellow, and we have another function of yellow to this the same something of orange, the types don't match, but I would still like to compose these two things. And this is an operator. Uh, this is called the Kleisley arrow for the person who invented the concept. And I'm not making this up because it looks like a fish. People call that the fish operator. Okay, so maybe now you're like, oh, I remember there was a fish at the beginning. They're starting to fall into place. Okay, so the fish operator. And the question is, how do we, because, you know, it's, I mean, the, the function composition is, is very uh, trivial to implement. You take the output of one function, you give it to the, the other one. But how do we implement this operator? Well, let's look at the types. So we have the first function that goes from A to M of B. I wonder what M stands for. And G from B to M of C. And I would like to have this operator that I can go from A to M of C bypassing the, a, the B even though the type don't match. So how can we do that? OK. So now, wait a second. You just told us about functor. Because up until now, this uh, wrapped type, I made zero assumption about it. But OK, now let's say we, we are recruiting for this, um, for this uh, wrapped type. And at the beginning, it was an open entry. Now we're saying, wait, 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 wait. To apply for the job, you need to be a functor. So let's see uh, if we can do something with that. So we start again. We have blue, but now the function goes from square, uh, I mean, goes to um, yellow in a, in a box. So now we, we know it's a functor, OK? And we have a function that goes from yellow to orange. So what was the definition of functor? Map. So OK, so now it's going to look a bit weird, so I want to go slow. Remember that map, it opens the box, text was inside the box, give it to the function, and then whatever is returned by the function puts it back into the box. And this is what happens. OK, we have two boxes now. Why? Well, again, the outer box, that's the one that is there originally. And the inner box is because, well, there's a box here. So now we have orange in a box in a box. And so this is what happens when we do map G after F. So F and then map G. And so if we look at the types, we see that if we do map G after F, we go from A to MM of C. But what we were looking for was to go from A to M of C. So here we have an extra box. It's like, you know, in your fridge, you're putting something in a Tupperware and then another Tupperware. I mean, unless it's a, a smelly French cheese, you don't really need to do that. So we're trying to get rid of this unnecessary box. So basically, what we would need is that we need something that can do this job, that can take box in the box to just one box. So now, this is basically the second job requirement. We say, OK, wait, wait. To get this job, you need to be a functor, and you also need to have this thing called flatten. And flatten is just a method that says if you have a double container, you just get rid of one because we don't need it. So now we start again. We have flatten, we have functor, we have G, and, and we start all over again. We start with blue, we go to yellow in the box. Now we apply map G. We have orange in a box in a box, then we apply flatten, orange in a box. And if we go from uh, if we do flatten after map G after F, we get the fish. We, we found the fish. That, that's what we were looking for from the beginning. Uh, and if we look at the types, this is exactly to implement this fish operator. We just need to say flatten after map after F. First we apply F, then map, then flatten. And this is the definition of functor that you can remember. And again, Boromir here is getting, no, that's not what the functor, that's not, sorry, monad, it's not correct. We don't care. If you remember that, or actually don't even remember it, because there's an even better definition coming after. Because this operation of doing map and then flatten, because it's a common thing, people call that flat map. 
So if we look at the types, map goes from, uh, if we want to compare map and flat map, you can see that map goes from, takes the function from A to B, and then it goes from MA to MB. But flat map takes the function from A to M of B, and then does the same, MA to MB. So if you want to know which one to use, in the context, it kind of depends on which monad you're looking at. But in the case of, for instance, optional, well, if you have an optional and you want to apply a computation that never fails, well, you can just write your function from A to B, and then you do map. But if you want to call another function that itself returns an optional, then you can just use flat map. And basically, this means that doing the fish operator, uh, it's basically just calling flat map. And if you're confused out of the difference between the fish operator and the flat map, let's look at this example with add. Add is a function that takes two int, returns another int. But when we uh, write code, we don't write add. We write a plus b, and behind the scene, the compiler rewrites that as add a b. So we can say that plus is the infix operator of the operation of adding. And it's basically the same between a fish operator and a flat map. Fish operator is the infix operator of flat map. And so if we now look back at our problem, we can see that simply if we, we have the split, the pass, the divide, now by using uh, optional and flat map, we can have a beautiful one-liner. And that is the definition of model that you should remember. If, uh, if you see a class in, the, in Java or in Kotlin or whatever, or in Scala, and you see a flat map, it's a monad. And actually, sometimes, it's, unfortunately, it's not called flat map. One example is the computi computable uh, future in, in Java. It's called and then. But if you look at the signature, you will see that it's exactly the same as uh, a monad, as, as flat map, sorry. So this is what you should remember. Monad is flat map. So some examples of monad that you might have seen, well, optional, either, all of these are monads. Asynchronous processes like completable future and promises, these, all of these are monads that you might have been using all the time. Uh, so if we um, summarize monad, um, well, a functor is a functor with flatten, or it's just something with flat map. The two are uh, equivalent definitions. And what are the advantages? Well, you can manage in control side effect. And the last one is important. It means that you can program with side effect as if they were not here. And this is what I call the cherry on top of the cake. Because uh, you kind of like, OK, we want to have the side effect managed, but we want to pretend that they're not here. And that's what Monad gives you, because you can chain your, uh, your call that have side effect as if they were not here. And so by using Monads, we can make of our partial function total. And uh, if we choose the wrap type to be, uh, yeah, and so compose function uh, with side effect with flat map. And so remember this uh, beautiful piece of code. That was already pretty nice. But now we know that optional is a monad. So optional has flat map. And look what it becomes. And this is kind of what I mean by functional programming is simpler. I mean, I don't think someone can argue with me that this is simpler than the one I've just seen, even in terms of sizes. So what's happening here? Well, we call split. Split returns uh, an optional. We know that optional is a monad. Well, we can just call flat map. And fl flat map will give us um, a handler uh, on, uh, using a lambda. Uh, we split, and we know then we can give that function then to the next one that itself returns a monad, so we use flat map. And then again, we continue. And the beauty with this code is that it's strictly equivalent to the one that we've seen before, which means that if any of those functions fail, it's going to bypass the whole computation and just returns optional empty. Remember that, uh, if I just go back to the previous slide, oops, sorry. Here we have this, at the end, we have the return optional empty that if any of the if fail, this is the default case. And it's exactly the same with this one. That if any of the computation fail, it will just return optional empty. Now, I think this is objectively better. And uh, I don't know if this is still the case, but I've been doing this talk for a few years now. And you know, this stuff came out in 2014. And every time I had programmers, oh my god, I've been using optional for several years and I didn't know it had flat map. So you know, this is something that you can use in your everyday code. Um, OK, so I kind of feel bad because I've been uh, bad-mouthing the functional programmers. I said they were greedy. And I kind of uh, forgot to say that they're hypocrites as well. Um, so why is that the case? It's because there is a bit of a joke going on out there that Haskell is the best imperative language, which is kind of strange because a Haskell is considered the best declarative language. So why are people joking about that? Well, I don't really want to scare you with Haskell, but I will show you it in Scala. Uh, why people are saying that. So this is uh, basically the same in Scala. It's a bit like Kotlin. You put the function keyword at the beginning, and the return type is at the end. And in Scala, optional is called option. So we have the same uh, functions, split, pass, and divide. 
And what you can do in Scala, you can do that. Now, this is called a for comprehension. And it's kind of interesting what's happening here is that within this for, I create a variable split, and I say split kind of equals calling the function split on s. But it's not equal, because if it was equal, the type of split would be an option. But you can see that in the next line, I'm passing split directly to parse. And parse doesn't take an option. It takes a pair. And the same for divide. And at the end, we just return divide. And so what's happening behind the scene is that this looks like a straight imperative code with no side effect management. But behind the scene, the compilers will rewrite this as a series of flat map. And what's even more beautiful is that the, the language, like Scala, understands what a monad is. So if you create your own data structure and you realize, wait a second, it's actually a monad. You just explain that to Scala. And then you can use your own data structure inside the full comprehension as well, which is kind of quite interesting. So before uh, we go, uh, we finish, I want to kind of emphasize one point. Uh, I mean, I've said it before, but I kind of want to really say it again. So I have this uh, quadrant here. And on the horizontal axis, uh, I have whether we are managing side effect or not. And on the vertical ax axis, whether the code that we wrote is composable or not. And we started here. We had this very nice code as a one-liner, but it was very unsafe code. And so by using um, the embellished type, by changing it to optional, we crossed the quadrant completely. We went into a situation where we have a managed side effect, but the code wasn't composable. And that was completely fine. You know, we had the vi uh, victory kit here. Like, we could have gone home. Like, the code was functionally working. But because, as a developers, we like to make our life easier, we decided to use monads to cross into the ideal state where we have composability, but we also have managed side effect. And this is what I call the cherry on top of the cake. So the key takeaways of this talk, remember, functor is something that has map. Again, not 100% correct, but good enough. Monad is something that has flat map. That if you want to uh, fix the partial function problem, you should pick your wrapper type to be monad so that you can manage side effect. And then you can use uh, monad, an official operator, to, com to compose those wrap type as if they were not there. Ah, yeah, sorry. That's my final joke. So if someone uh, is asking you, you know, oh, I wanted to go to this talk, you know, what the F is a monad, you can just tell them a monad is the cherry on top of the cake that's actually a fish. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. That was a great punchline. Uh, <coughs> So if you want some, uh, you know, if you're interested about this stuff, I highly recommend that you, um, you look into Bartosz Milewski's stuff. So he will go into the detail, into the theory, and you will see that, okay, there's a little bit more to Monad than what I've shown, but I've shown you the, really the gist of it. Uh, there are some good talks out there on how to apply uh, functional patterns uh, in Java. And I also put uh, here, if you want to search, The Art of Simplicity uh, by Venka. That's the talk that I talked about, the simplicity and familiarity being um, two orthogonal concepts. And yeah, uh, thank you. I mean, I don't know about Ashmineski, I wish, but I still want to say thank you for uh, inspiring me in this journey. And then uh, a few friends that have uh, actual uh, math uh, backgrounds and that have been uh, helping me as well understand all of this. And uh, yeah, and that's it. I still have actually a bit of time left, so we can uh, do questions if anyone has. Um, I don't know if I'm able to get them from the app, but I will. if you have a question here, I can repeat it. Yes. Uh, so I have so arrow. So the question is, how do I see arrow in this picture? Uh, I think it's very interesting. Uh, so arrow is a, is, a, is a library that was written for Kotlin to bring all of the this advanced functional programming. Um, I haven't used it in my like day to day job in production. I've played with it. I kind of really like that. So they recently released version one, and on, and before that. What I liked about them that they would try something and they would get feedback and they had a lot of re-engineering. So I think if you would like to do functional programming and you're, you think Scala, uh, you know, I mean, if you're a Java developer, uh, you should def first you should go to Kotlin, uh, 100%. Kotlin is an amazing language. And then, if you, and then I, would, I would actually recommend uh, reading the Arrow documentation and it can introduce you to a lot of, uh, all of these concepts. Like for instance, yeah, you, have in, you have in Arrow, you have a data class that represents monad. And, the reason, and why is this good? Because then you can write function that work on any monad. And I think this is probably the most, um, when I talk about simplicity and familiarity, is that when you look at Haskell code or Scala code, sometimes you're like, you, you, you know, you, you do a big computation. You have, let's say, for instance, you have a list of optional, and you want, to, for instance, you have a list of user ID, 
And then for each user ID, you call a database that gives you an optional of a user. So now you have a list of optional of user. What you would like, actually, is an option of list of users. So you might kind of like write all the code to do this. And then you see someone in Haskell, they go, oh, yeah, there's one line that does that. Because there are things like switching between, uh, here it's an applicative and a, and a monad, but sw switching between these two types of data structure, it's something that is so abstract that you can implement it for any class. And then you can just reuse it. So there's a lot of, uh, uh, there is power in being able to abstract some of these things. Because there is a lot of, um, you know, when we write code, for instance, when we're looping through a list, I mean, that's an obvious thing that we do all the time, that, okay, it makes sense to have for each, makes sense to have map. But there's things that are even deeper that we don't realize that actually they are a common thing that you don't even need to know anything about your application. It's a generic thing. So yes, a Kotlin RO I would, I would recommend. Any other questions? I've got a question for you now. Do you all know what the model is now, or? Huh? Medium? Flat map. <laughs> ah, flat map, yes, yeah, sorry. Yes, that's it, that's right. So yeah, do have a look at your code, explore. Um, it's the sharing fish, yes. That is the that's actually the formal mathematical definition. I'm happy that you <laughs> remember it. <laughs> I'm a bit early, so I hope I didn't go too fast. Uh, but yeah. Ah, question at the back? For what, sorry, that gone? Rust. Rust. Yeah. Okay. So what's the correlation when you have a value and? Yeah. Okay, so that's, so that's uh, one of the, so this is called the either type. So uh, in functional programming, you have either, so you have a left type and a right type. Um, and yeah, you would basically say that your left type is your error type, so it could be an exception, or it could be your own. Um, most of the time, what you would do is you would create your own data classes uh, that represent your default failures mode, like a big enum, and you would put that into your left type, and you would return that if you have an error. And then you would have a lot of, for instance, an arrow, a lot of uh, helper methods, like for instance, it can do a try catch for you. It will automatically, uh, if it's a success, return you the right of the result. Or if there's an exception, it will catch it and then it will put it inside uh, a left and return it for you. And uh, I wanted to say as well, if you're kind of interested in type theory, I'm doing a lunch talk tomorrow about how to do algebra with types. So it's a little bit more. Uh, it's not like again, there is no. Not much math in there, but it's kind of if you're interested in, because you can actually add and multiply types. So that's the, the teaser for tomorrow. Thank you.